It's time for Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, inviting the atheist, agnostic, and skeptic to examine for themselves the evidence for the Christian faith. We are all limited by what we do not know and by the things we think we know but are not true. Dr. Joe Mott earned his Ph.D. at LSU and was a distinguished math professor at Florida State University for 38 years, helping to write three math textbooks and authoring over 30 research articles in math. He is now the host of this radio program, Defending and Commending the Faith. Here is Joe Mott. In the previous episode, I discussed two reasons why the deity of Jesus Christ was necessary. First, to fulfill prophecy, and second, to manifest deity. In each case, I listed several evidential warrants supporting those reasons. In particular, I gave four strands of evidences supporting the reason to manifest deity. Allow me to give a fifth strand of evidence. For those ancient docetists, who accepted the deity of Christ but denied his humanity, the situation has in our present time been reversed. Instead, many people now are willing to accept his humanity but deny his deity. At present, the unbeliever will likely agree that Jesus was a good man, a prophet, perhaps a sage, In the book, Fundamentals of the Faith, Peter Kieft writes, Well then, if he was a sage, you can trust him and believe the essential things he says. And the essential thing he says is that he is the divine Savior of the world, and that you must come to him for salvation. If he is a sage, you must accept his essential teaching as true, If his teaching is false, then he is not a sage. Jesus' words authenticate Kreef's statement. In a prayer to God, Jesus said, Your word is truth. To his disciples, he said, No person can come to the Father except through me. He also said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. To Nicodemus, Jesus declared, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus even went so far as to insist belief in the claim that he was the unique Son of God was a litmus test for his followers. Paul wrote Timothy, From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He also said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. A third reason that the deity of Christ is necessary is to redeem humanity. If he is not God who became flesh, the redemption he offers is powerless to forgive and to save. The Bible declares that the idea and the plan for salvation comes from the Lord, Jonah Chapter 2, verse 9. The whole of Scripture is designed to show that no human being could ever save man. For we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, and there is only one who is good. So we can conclude that any person, being a sinner, not righteous, not good in himself, and not able to save himself, therefore would himself need to be saved by another. It is God whom we have wronged as sinners, and therefore only God can redeem us. 
The Bible tells us that we cannot earn our salvation. Neither works of charity nor acts of penance can rid ourselves of the burden of sin. That burden is too heavy for a mere human to carry. The Bible also says that salvation is a gift obtained only by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' deity is necessary because some people object to the Christian doctrine of the atonement by arguing that no man can die for another man's sins. That's true. There is no way any mere human can bear and fully satisfy God's wrath against sin. God's wrath is infinite in quality. Only someone who was infinitely powerful could bear to pay the full penalty of the sins of humanity. In order to bear that weight, it is essential that the Savior be divine. That is why Jesus was no mere man, but the eternal second person of the Godhead, the unique Son of God, whose shed blood has infinite value in paying the penalty for our sins. The next evidence supporting the reason why the deity of Jesus is necessary, namely to redeem humanity, if Jesus is not divine, the Christian doctrine of the atonement would be a hoax. If Jesus is not fully God, we have no salvation and ultimately, no Christianity. But if Jesus is divine, then his claims are true and worthy of our full commitment to what all he implied. He said, no one comes to the Father but through me. He claimed that he and the Father were one. To know him was to know God. To see him was to see God. To receive him was to receive God. To believe in him was to believe in God, and to honor him was to honor God. But to hate him was to hate God. Therefore, as Peter said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The fourth evidence that supports redeeming humanity Only someone who was truly God could be the mediator and the reconciler between God and man. If Jesus is God, believers can rely on his promise and his authority that our sins are forgiven through faith in his death on the cross. Moreover, believers can have assurance that he has given us eternal life we will never perish, and that he is coming back to receive us unto himself. In short, Jesus needed to be divine in order to satisfy God and to have the power to save us, and he needed to be fully human in order to become a propitiatory sacrifice, sympathize with humanity, and to adequately represent us. A fourth reason the deity of Jesus Christ is necessary is because it is the essential presupposition for the finality of the Christian revelation. If Jesus is not divine, then the revelation he reportedly brings is not that of the Godhead. It is therefore not the final revelation from God and may be superseded. The denial of Jesus' deity is a refutation of the entire Christian truth claim at one fell stroke. And we are back where we were before the gospel came to us, weakly groping in the darkness of our own unenlightened, desperate reason. The deity of Christ is like a skeleton key that opens the doors to all the other Christian doctrines. For if Jesus Christ is divine, he can be trusted to be infallible in everything he declared. 
The Old Testament is accepted as divinely inspired word of God because Jesus himself accepted it as so. We accept the Gospels as reliable because they were written early enough to be within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry and the resurrection, corroborated by non-Christian authors, archaeology, and history. The New Testament affirms again and again the full deity of Jesus Christ. It explicitly refers to him as God, describes him as the image of God. Hebrews 1.3 says he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Many passages attribute actions or words to Jesus that could only be true of God. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, Colossians 1.19. And in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, Colossians 2.9. His name is rightly called Emmanuel, that is, God with us. Matthew 1, verse 23. His title, Lord, appears often in contexts where it clearly stands for the Old Testament name, Yahweh. After washing the feet of his disciples, Jesus said to them, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. John 13, verse 13. The New Testament credits Jesus as doing God's work, such as creating and sustaining the world. It accords all divine honors to him, such as worship, prayer, and reverence. After the resurrection, the Apostle Paul and the other New Testament writers refer to Christ in more than individual personal terms. Believers are in Christ. The church is the body of Christ, and it is described as the household, building, temple, dwelling place of God in the Spirit. C.F.D. Mole said these corporate terms reflect an experience of Christ which implies such dimensions as any theist would ascribe to God himself. A fifth reason the deity of Christ is necessary is to give Jesus' authority to believers to defend Christianity, to evangelize the unenlightened, and to oppose evil in the world. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus gives believers the Great Commission to evangelize based on his authority. If he is not divine, that authority is no better than my authority or your authority. But if he is divine, his deity gives believers that authority and the duty to speak out against evil practices of the culture. Paul writes, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Proverbs says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. There are some things in the world that are unquestionably evil. Racism is evil. Abortion is evil. Genocide is evil. Harvesting body parts while people are still alive is evil. Sex trafficking is evil. To redefine what throughout human history has meant by marriage and the family, that is evil. On and on I could go. Since Jesus is divine, then all the reasons for the necessity of his deity avail. The Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled. Jesus' deity is manifested in the world. Redemption is brought to humanity through him. Final truth is revealed in him. And his authority is available to believers to defend Christianity and evangelize a dying world. Thus his claims are true and worthy of our full commitment to all he implied. We are fortified by both his humanity and his deity. Both are essential to being orthodox to the Christian 
faith. If the Christian worldview is true, not relatively true, but absolutely true, then it ought to be obvious that other worldviews are mistaken. That does not mean they are wrong on every point, but taken as a whole, they cannot be true. To say otherwise would be a foolish mistake. Some religions teach the deity of Jesus and others deny it. Okay, but is it not clear that somebody is right and somebody is wrong on that score? The three monotheistic faiths see God as a distinct individual person, whereas some Eastern religions understand God as the impersonal sum of everything put together. Is it not clear that if there really is a God, both of these two notions cannot be true of him at the same time? When anyone dies, they might go to heaven, to hell, be reincarnated, or simply disappear into nothing. But even a child can see they cannot do them all at the same time. That's not bigotry or narrow-mindedness. It's simple logic. Who among us can resist logic? Thank you for listening to Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, a production of Wave 94 Radio in Tallahassee, Florida. If you have any questions or comments for Joe, please forward them to Doug Apple at Wave 94 at this email address, dougapple at wave94.com. And be sure to join us every Monday evening at 6.45 p.m. on Wave 94 and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott.